Hey, it's Darius. Let's talk about some audit best bets. You take an audit in the next day or so, what can you expect to see? Well, for sure, assertions. So if they ask you a question like this, the auditor is gathering evidence regarding the accumulated depreciation of fixed assets, what assertion is being impacted, and you're sitting here looking at these assertions like existence and valuation, rights and obligations. For most CPA candidates, it's a little more than a guess because most just don't understand how do you approach an assertion question, especially on assets. And it's very simple. Any question on assets where the auditor is gathering evidence and the auditor is focusing on the contra asset, like accumulated depreciation, then the answer to what assertion is being impacted is always valuation. So make yourself a note. If the CPA audit exam wants to know what assertion is being impacted and the question has something to do with assets and the auditor is gathering evidence regarding the contra asset, then the answer is always valuation assertion, in this case letter B. So if the asset in question is fixed assets like it is here, and the auditor is gathering evidence regarding the accumulated depreciation of fixed assets, like it says in the question, accumulated depreciation is the contra asset with regard to equipment and fixed assets. So the answer would always be valuation because the auditor is focused on the contra asset. If this were accounts receivable and the auditor was looking for evidence with regard to the aging schedule, which is used to prepare the allowance for doubtful accounts, which is the contra asset, then you would know if this were a question on accounts receivable and what assertion applies. If the auditor was looking at the aging schedule, that helps the auditor gather evidence with regard to the contra asset, the allowance for doubtful accounts. The answer would once again be valuation. Existence would be the right answer with an asset question if they're asking you that the auditor is focusing in on the gross amount of the asset, not the net amount. So check out this question. An auditor sends external confirmation requests to client customers in order to gain audit satisfaction with regard to what assertion? Okay, so here's an asset, accounts receivable. The auditor is sending external confirmation requests to client customers. Why would you do that? Because as an auditor, you're focused on whether that receivable exists, whether it's real. If you don't get a reply back from the customer, you're going to think that the customer's fake and that the client made up the receivable and it doesn't really exist as of year end. So the answer to which assertion applies would be existence, not valuation. So letter B would be correct. Why isn't valuation a good choice for confirmations? Because valuation deals with the net amount of the receivable, not the gross amount. If they wanted the answer to be valuation, they tell you that the auditor was primarily focused on the aging schedule, the allowance for doubtful accounts. That would help the auditor determine the net realizable value of accounts receivable or valuation. So if you're stuck between existence and valuation of assets in an assertion question, ask yourself where's the auditor focusing? If the auditor is focusing in on the top line number, then the assertion is existence. But if the auditor is primarily concerned with the bottom line number of the asset, the net realizable value, then the answer would be valuation. All right, so speaking of the revenue cycle with sales and receivables and cash collections, in what order do these three forms usually get generated in a credit sales system? And you would need to know that the sales order is generated first, followed by the bill of lading, and then the sales invoice. So letter A would be the right answer. Why does it matter whether the sales order is generated first, then a bill of lading, then a sales invoice? Because of the two directional testing questions that they're going to ask you. Questions like this. An auditor begins with entries in the sales journal and make sure that there is a shipping document to support it. Well, when do entries get made in the sales journal? At the end of the transaction cycle. 
So remember, first you have the sales order, letter A, then the bill of lading, then the sales invoice, and after the sales invoice, then entry is made into the sales journal to record that day's sale. So then if the auditor begins with entries in that sales journal and makes sure that there's a shipping document to support it, the auditor is testing backwards, starting with the end of the transaction and looking for support to make sure that the client didn't just make up the sale and record a fictitious sale. So this would test the existence occurrence assertion Roman numeral one is good because we're looking for sales now. We're looking to make sure that sales are not overstated. And we're going backwards, starting with what was recorded as a sale. And we're making sure that for every recorded sale, that there's a shipping document. Because anytime there's a recorded sale with no shipping document, the auditor would think that there's fraud. Somebody's cooking the books, recording sales that never happened. So Roman numeral one, this tests existence occurrence. And anytime you see existence occurrence, you're dealing with overstatement. So Roman numeral two says the auditor is concerned with overstatement of revenue. That would be correct. Because if you're concerned with overstatement, you start with what was recorded as a sale, and then you work backwards to make sure that the sale really should have been recorded. Because that's what the client's asserting with regard to occurrence of sales, that the sale really did occur. The client's asserting that the sale really did occur, and as a result, the receivable really does exist. But the auditor is not just going to believe that without testing it. And the way to test it is to start with what was recorded as a sale and go backwards to make sure that there are shipping documents to support every sale recorded. So C is the right answer, and this is exactly the kind of question that they'll ask you when testing evidence, evidence gathering. They'll test it in the cycles, and we're here in the revenue cycle right now. Now, what about this one? In determining whether transactions have been recorded, the direction of the audit testing should be from the... So here's another two-directional testing where they're asking you, which direction should you start this test? Where should you start from? Should you start at the end of the cycle, the general ledger balance, or the adjusted trial balance, or the general journal entries? That's the end of the cycle. Or should you start earlier in the cycle with the original source document? Well, if they're asking you whether transactions have been recorded, you would start with the original source document, and then you would go forward into the accounting records to make sure that whatever should have been recorded really was recorded. And if this were sales, and you found original source documents like shipping documents, and you started there with the shipping documents, then you would look to make sure that everything that was shipped out was recorded as a sale. And the reason why you would make sure of that, not because the client's accounting department is going to, uh, on purpose, not record sales. Of course, they wouldn't do that. But instead, you're afraid that somebody in the company is stealing by shipping goods out and then no sale gets recorded later on. So if you find original source documents like shipping documents and you don't see sales recorded, then something's understated. Sales would be understated. That would be the completeness assertion. And the answer here would be C, of course. And you can learn so much from a question like this. You can't memorize this kind of thing. You have to understand that wherever the auditor starts the test is what the auditor already assumes took place. So in determining whether transactions have been recorded, that's what we want to know, whether transactions have been recorded. We can't start with what was recorded because what was recorded assumes that something was recorded. We want to know whether something has been recorded or not. We can't start with what was recorded. We got to start with the original source document, like the shipping document, and say, here's a bunch of bills of lading that indicate shipments. Now we want to know whether those transactions that were shipped out were recorded as a sale. So we got to start with the original source document, which would be the bill of lading in the revenue cycle. Now, of course, there is a possible silver lining. If we find a bunch of bills of lading where no sale was ever recorded, yes, we're thinking that there could be theft, 
somebody shipped out goods without anybody knowing it. But there's a possibility that there could be consignment shipments going on, and that means there'll be no, no theft. So at that point, if we find a bunch of source documents like shipping documents and there were no recorded sales, then we would hit the company up and ask them for a list of consignment shipments. We'd say, hey, give us a list of consignment shipments, and hopefully all those bills of lading would match up to the consignment shipments, and then we wouldn't be worried about theft anymore. But if they came back and said, no, we don't ship on consignment, every shipment is a sale, then we would be worried about theft if we found these bills of lading where no sale was recorded. I can't emphasize enough how many candidates don't understand a basic question like this. And they see it, and it hurts their energy, hurts their confidence, and the exam goes downhill from there. So if you understand this, three or four additional points for you just for feeling good about understanding this kind of thing and knowing that when you see it, you can identify a two-directional test question. Got to be able to do it. All right, and then here's one on inventory errors. They're going to ask you, how much should the company report as inventory at the end of the year? It says they counted and got a million five, but that was before any necessary adjustments. And here's one of the adjustments. They tell you merchandise that cost 90000 that was shipped FOB shipping point from a vendor to the company was received and recorded on January 5th, but notice when it was shipped to the company, it was shipped on December 30th, so this 90000 should have been included in inventory, and it wasn't. So you're going to have to add this 90000 to inventory, because as the buyer, anything shipped FOB shipping point on December 30th would be yours. All right, what about the second one? Now they're talking about this company being the seller, and they're saying goods in the shipping area were excluded from inventory, although shipment was not made until January 4th. And the goods billed to the customer, FOB shipping point on December 30th, had a cost of 120. So this $120,000 of inventory cost, should it be in the million five? Well, it isn't right now because it was in the shipping area. It wasn't counted because it should have gone out on December 30th, but it says it never did go out on December 30th. Shipment wasn't made until January 4th. So add this 120000 which wasn't really sold yet, even though it wasn't counted at year-end, it should have been. So add both of these back to inventory, and the right amount would be D, a million seven ten. So you got to know your way around your FOBs for an analysis-type question like that. Okay, now how about this? Something new, and you know the exam. If it's new, they're going to ask about it. The new report for the issuer. Which of the following is in the opening section of the Peekaboo Audit Report for an issuer? One, our audits include performing procedures to assess the risk of material misstatement of financial statements, whether due to error or fraud. Well, that sounds nice, but that's not in the opening section because the opening section has what in it? The opinion. Right, so number two, in our opinion, the financial statements present fairly in all material respects. That's the opening section of the Peekaboo Audit Report for the issuer. So B is correct. You would expect to find, in our opinion, in the opening section. In the second section, you'd expect to find things like, our audits include performing procedures to assess the risks of material misstatement. So this was all changed very recently, and now the opinion section is in the first part of the audit report for the issuer. Got to know that. And here's the first section of the new audit report for the issuer. And you can see the opinion right in the first section. In our opinion, the financial statements present fairly in all material respects. That's in the first section now of the audit report for the issuer. The second section, what comes after that, doesn't have the opinion in it. It just talks about the audit and what an audit involves. All that's in the second section. But the opinion's in the first section. And then there's even a third section now, and you've got to know, talking about critical audit matters, which is a new section of the audit report for the issuer, the third section, a section devoted to critical audit matters. And when do you need to include the third section on critical audit matters for an audit report, 
of an issuer? Is it all the time? Well, no. No. If the opinion is unqualified or qualified, then you need a section on critical audit matters. If the opinion is adverse or disclaimer, then you do not need a section on critical audit matters. So here's a good example of a question that you might see because it's so new. According to Peekaboo, which of the following is a label that identifies a section of the audit report for an issuer? Okay, is one section labeled basis for opinion? Yes. Number one is right. Two, is one section of the new audit report for the issuer labeled introductory section? No. Is one section labeled critical audit matters? Yes. So the answer is one in three. Answer choice A. Under Peekaboo Audit Standards, an audit report for an issuer must have a section on critical audit matters if the auditor's opinion on the financial statements is adverse, no, but qualified, yes. Letter B is the answer. This is Darius Clark from CPAExamTutoring.com, home of the I-75 CPA review course, saying good luck with your audit exam.